Okay, so let's move along. We're getting double duty out of Jeff this round. Um, and we're on to the next presentation. In 2017, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine assembled a committee uh, with multiple charges. And they were to review the current practices and return of results to participants, to review the current regulatory requirements for that, those re that type of research, to assess the available information and potential benefits and harms to patients, and to participants. And Jeff actually chaired that committee, and uh, he graciously agreed to uh, give a summary of the report, which was published in June or July this yes, year? Yes, July. And we thought it would be of interest to many people around the table. So, Jeff? Great. Thanks, Rudy. And, I, and uh, a lot of this discussion, of course, uh, traditionally in recent years has come out of the genetics genomics uh, community. And as I'll say in a minute, our report was not focused on genetics per se, but uh, folks in this community have generated quite a bit of the background uh, issues that uh, generated an interest in this report. So here's our committee members, uh, just an outstanding group of folks, some of whom uh, will be familiar to folks uh, here, uh, Wiley Burke, uh, for example. Uh, but people from a variety of different backgrounds, and I would say going into this report, we had no, um, it was a consensus report, so the task was to achieve consensus. And uh, no guarantee at the beginning that that was going to occur, given the different perspectives that this group uh, brought to the table. So uh, we did achieve consensus. And so it really just was a pleasure to work with this group. Uh, outstanding staff from uh, National Academies who uh, are just very knowledgeable and hardworking. And then we have several consultants, Christy Guarini from a law perspective. Uh, Rebecca Davies supported some of our laboratory uh, um, recommendations, and then Javi Moram, who's a philosopher who helped us think through some of the ethical issues. These were the sponsors of the report, uh, CMS, FDA, and the NIH. <clears throat> so I think fair to say, and maybe the experience of many of the folks here, that uh, return of individual research results hasn't been a standard uh, or common practice. Uh, I've been out of the IRB world, or at least not on the panel for uh, few years, but it was pretty typical in the past that this consent form simply said, we're not going to give you results back. In fact, a lot of times they were silent on things like whether you get your pregnancy test result back. That part's gotten better, but um, fair to say that this just hasn't been a strong uh, tradition. Uh, and for good reasons, if not conclusive reasons. Risks associated with return of uh, inaccurate results. Research is, by its very nature, uncertain. and. Uh, uh, folks may make uh, life decisions based on uh, what proves uh, subsequently to be uh, false uh, results. Or they may be hard to um, understand and they may be misunderstood and, again, uh, inappropriate decisions made. Uh, research courses for the benefit of society and not uh, individuals. And so there's a real concern about blurring the line between clinical research and clinical care, that folks may think, as with this notion of the therapeutic misconception, that the reason they've been assigned to this particular group in a study is because their doctor thinks that's the right group for them, um, when we know the reason is to try to answer a, a clinically relevant question. <clears throat> so there's some real concerns here. In addition, prompting the uh, report uh, were some um, fairly long-standing conflicts in regulations that have just not been resolved. So you have CLIA, which has been absolutely critical to help uh, support quality uh, laboratory services in clinical medicine. But uh, if your laboratory is not CLIA certified, you are prohibited from returning results to individuals. And that includes, under CMS's interpretation, any notion that we have something of interest that we would like to confirm in a CLIA lab, that, from CMS's standpoint, is in and of itself returning a result and is uh, precluded. Uh, in conflict with that is uh, HIPAA. Again, just uh, essential uh, regulation over time for protecting uh, personal health uh, information. Um, and uh, uh, the PHI includes medical records and other info included in what's called the designated record set. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So requires, HIPAA requires a return of results requested by a, a participant when the, when the uh, entity is a HIPAA-covered uh, entity, regardless of whether they were generated in a CLIA-certified lab or not. So you've got the investigator who's uh, on the horns of a dilemma, if you will. If a participant comes forward, requests their results, and your laboratory analysis as part of your research wasn't uh, 
uh, uh, CLIA certified, then you got to break one of these rules, and both of them have fairly significant uh, penalties for uh, violation. So here was our charge. Um, this is a, a brief synopsis of a fairly uh, a long set of uh, uh, guidelines here. But determine when, if and when it's appropriate to return individual research results to participants by looking at current practices, uh, evidence of benefits, risks, and costs, and then thinking about the ethical, social, operational, and regulatory aspects. Several things were clearly outside our scope. Uh, results not generated from human uh, biospecimens. So our focus really was biospecimen-focused uh, research. So social behavior research, imaging research, for example, uh, were outside our scope. Now, we think our recommendations are just as relevant to those domains, or at least uh, applicable in many circumstances to those domains, but they were uh, uh, not part of our conversation. Biobanking and specimens that are anonymized or de-identified were um, not on our uh, plate. Aggregate results, many investigators now are returning aggregate results, meaning what did the study show, what were the findings of the study. Um, <clears throat> that's very much a laudable uh, uh, direction to be moving, but that was not part of our discussion. Um, analysis of CMS's current interpretation of CLIA uh, was off our plate and laboratory uh, developed test regulations uh, through the FDA were not part of our portfolio either. Despite that, we got a 400-page report out of it, so. <laughs> All right, so a number of potential benefits uh, for the return of individual uh, results. And we think the key one is uh, better relationships between investigators and uh, participants. What I don't say here, I think I have it on another slide, there's a lot of research that shows that people actually do want these results, or many people do. And you can say in the consent form, we're not going to return any results. But then still, as the study winds up, it's like, so, OK, where are my results? How come you guys aren't talking to me about my results? So they, they want it, and they sort of expect it as part of the relationship. And, and so uh, uh, meeting that need, we think, is going to have some real uh, advantages. So better relationships between investigators and participants, more transparency and trust about what the enterprise is about. We think then potentially better recruitment and retention which could lead to cost savings, or maybe not cost savings, at least partially offset the costs of uh, returning the uh, results. And as everybody knows, recruitment and retention are a huge issue with uh, clinical uh, research. So anything that improves that may be, uh, have some significant uh, uh, beneficial impacts. So improvements in efficiency, generalizability, participant centeredness, uh, et cetera. <coughs> so what are the risks and costs? Uh, again, participants may make decisions based on inaccurate or misinterpreted information. People may well be harmed by this process. Adverse psychosocial effects, uh, negative impacts on individuals, negative impacts on families um, may occur. Uh, that's been a big focus of the whole LC enterprise from pretty early on. Literature tends to show people do pretty well with adverse information, um, but uh, nevertheless uh, has to be uh, a concern. Legal liabilities for research institutions. So this, though, goes both ways. <clears throat> if you fail to return uh, a result that you have that could be critically important for somebody's uh, uh, life and health care, maybe there's a liability uh, claim there. At the same time, if you do return something that proves to be false uh, and people make a critical decision based on that information, then maybe there's some liability on that side as well. So there are legal dimensions here on both uh, sides of the equation. No question that it's, this is a time, personnel, resources, expertise uh, enterprise. This is something additional that investigators are going to have to do beyond what they've done uh, uh, before. And that leads to potentially opportunity costs. And we heard specifically from some uh, uh, lay advocates in the community who said, if this is, means the, you're not going to be doing more research about, about my baby's condition, I don't want the results. Don't spend a lot of money on that. Now, that was one person's input, but the point being that there's opportunity costs, and will we decrease the total volume of uh, uh, research being done by focusing some resources on this uh, <coughs> set of issues? So in general, we think the early evidence suggests benefits have been understated of return and that the risk overstated, or at least in many circumstances, the risk can be mitigated. But we don't have a lot of good data. Uh, and the costs are real, but no doubt uh, variable. 
So what are the ethical considerations here? And I think our group uh, really has some wonderful input from a variety of folks who are um, pretty experienced in the bioethics uh, domain. And it's a, it's a difficult <laughs> subject to tackle, but I think what we concluded was that there is an obligation to return results in a pretty narrow set of circumstance when there's a sort of imminent danger to somebody that can be averted through the return of those uh, results. Uh, and that's not a particularly common uh, circumstance, but it's a rescue duty to warn sort of phenomenon. In other circumstances, there's probably not an ethical duty to return, but really comes down to an opportunity to um, demonstrate our respect for values that are at the core of the clinical enterprise. And that's respect for persons, beneficence, and justice, going back to the Belmont Report uh, um, principles. And as mentioned, research demonstrates that many participants want and expect uh, their uh, results. So um, not ethically required, but an opportunity, uh, we think, to enhance uh, uh, respect for participants uh, and transparency. Um, but having said that, this last bullet uh, critical, there's certainly uh, uh, many circumstances where it may be inappropriate to return uh, results for a variety of reasons. <coughs> So a couple of guiding principles we uh, identified. Uh, because research results have value to many participants, return of results should be routinely considered as a matter of reciprocity, respect, transparency, and trust. I'll go back to this notion of routinely considered. Uh, when assessing the value of returning results, trade-offs for all the stakeholders should be considered. And that's all the stakeholders, meaning the participants, the sponsors, the investigators, the institution, uh, et cetera. When results are offered, participants can decide whether to receive or share their results. So this is pretty boilerplate. We're not forcing results on anybody. They get an opportunity to learn them if they want them. Communication is key to promoting understanding of the meaning and limitations of the information. Uh, validity and reliability, we'll touch on uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, crucial to providing value uh, of this information to a variety of stakeholders and, and inclusion of diverse populations critical to the conduct of uh, high quality uh, research. So, uh, researchers should seek input from participants and communities to accommodate the full spectrum of needs and preferences around this particular issue, uh, along with other issues. So <clears throat> uh, decisions on return are going to vary depending on the characteristics of the research, the nature of the results, and the interests of the participants. So here are sort of three different um, sets of issues that we want investigators to think about. One is the planned offer. When are you going to offer people the results as they're generated uh, or at some point in the research uh, enterprise. Secondly, how are you going to respond if you're not offering, but they're requesting? Talked about the HIP access, right? How do you deal with that? <clears throat> and then the third one that's been so prominent in uh, the genetics domain, uh, unanticipated findings. Um, something crops up that you hadn't anticipated, and hopefully as folks begin to think this through at the beginning uh, more carefully, that'll be... Uh, less common than it's been with, uh, and I think, the genetic research enterprise where you had samples collected under one set of consent forms and expectations, and now it's five years later, and you've got a, a, a result that you think is clinically relevant. What are you going to do with that? So here's our general rubric. Justification for return becomes stronger as the potential value of the results to participants and the feasibility of return increase. So fairly straightforward. Uh, if it's of limited value to participants under their articulation and the feasibility is low, then there's a weak justification for return uh, and the converse being true. Now, we use the term value to participants, and that's going to be clinical utility to a significant extent, but it's also this notion of personal utility. And we don't want to get into the whole debate about unpacking those two kinds of concepts. You know, personal utility being I'm going to use it for my life planning, even though the doctor can't do anything with it. Uh, and clinical utility, of course, being uh, the, the doctor's view of the world. So uh, we're trying to collapse both of those into value of participant uh, concept here. And this is central, the need for a quality management system for research laboratories. Uh, I'd be interested in uh, feedback from a lot of members of this group. Um, confidence in the validity of the research results is critical, but <clears throat> many research labs do not have uh, quality systems in place. So CLIA is not appropriate, uh, we don't think, for everybody. I think CLIA's answer to a lot of the CLIA problems is just get CLIA certified, but um, a lot of investigators are uh, fairly resistant to that uh, solution. But what, where does that leave the community? 
And I think, as we heard, there are research laboratories that are not CLIA certified that really perform at the highest level of uh, quality standards, equivalent or exceeding CLIA. But there's other mom and pop shops where folks don't pay a whole lot of attention to uh, uh, quality. And uh, how does that, uh, where does that leave us with respect to thinking about uh, uh, results emerging from that laboratory uh, environment? <coughs> So we think it's a worthwhile effort for government agencies to develop an externally accountable quality management system for research laboratories. I'll we'll touch a little bit more on that here in a minute. In addition, we need to harmonize federal regulations. As uh, mentioned, HIPAA-CLIA are in conflict. Uh, we don't know uh, how institutions are interpreting those, how they're uh, acting based on those uh, conflicts. In addition, FDA regulations are unclear regarding how return of results impacts the IDE process. And then regulatory uh, conflicts uh, create, uh, uh, we think, inconsistent and inequitable access for participants and dilemmas for uh, labs, investigators, and institutions. So um, recommendations, and I'm not going to go through them in order. We have 12 recommendations. I'm going to give you a, sort of a synopsis of them in uh, uh, different categories. So determining conditions under which individual research results will be returned. Investigators and institutions should routinely consider whether and how to return individual research results on a study-specific basis through a thoughtful decision-making process. So one of the directions we could have taken with this report was to try to say, you know, here's the types of results that are most appropriate for return. Here's the types of results that are less appropriate for return. And sort of try to create buckets of that sort as a way of guidance. We, didn't, we made no progress on that because of the number of variables uh, in uh, the conduct of research. And so it really is a matter of thinking this through on a study-specific basis. So investigators should include plans and protocols that describe whether results will be returned, and if so, when and how. Now, again, understanding that the decision might be we're not returning results, and here, but you have to have a reason for it, at least at this point. Research sponsors and funding agencies should require that applications for funding consistently address the issue. And maybe what this means for NIH applications is including some, another element in the application, you know, like your data sharing policy. Now you got to say something about that. Maybe you need to say, are you going to return results to participants or not? And again, if the answer is no, fine, but describe why that is, and the peer reviewers can take a look at that and make a decision about whether that uh, looks like a, uh, the right decision. <clears throat> Institutions and IRB should develop policies to support the review of plans to return results. And this is a new task for IRBs, because they'll need uh, additional types of expertise to be able to assess uh, uh, these plans as they come forward. So we really finger the National Institutes of uh, Health here as uh, uh, what we think should be the lead um, effort to do an interagency effort, including non-governmental stakeholders, to develop an externally accountable QMS quality management system for non-CLIA certified research laboratories. And this isn't coming completely out of left field, as I understand. NCI and uh, other institutes have um, done some work in this particular area, been thinking about this issue. European colleagues are uh, uh, working on the, the whole notion of uh, quality management systems for the research lab. So uh, this isn't, uh, this is a familiar concept uh, um, to some extent. So here's one of the central set of considerations then. Institutions and their IRB should permit investigators to return individual research results if testing is conducted in a CLIA certified lab, okay, straightforward, or results are not intended for clinical decision making uh, in the study protocol, and testing is cu conducted under an externally quality management system for research labs once that uh, thing gets uh, uh, developed. <clears throat> Or the IRB determines that potential benefits are sufficiently high, risks of harm are low, quality analysis is sufficient, and information will be provided regarding the limits on test validity and interpretation. So this set of considerations be it below the CLIA certified lab criterion uh, is probably most applicable to the request for information and for the incidental findings. And this sort of gets us out of the uh, handcuffs uh, that uh, CLIA has provided that says if it's not CLIA certified, you don't say anything. Now we're trying to provide a path forward to say this ought to be an IRB reviewed sort of phenomenon. And many sorts of results aren't the, you know, are you going to get cancer or are you not going to get cancer sort of result, much lower valence types of considerations. And so um, that would be part of the formula that the uh, um, 
review process would look to to see whether uh, uh, in this circumstance return is appropriate. Uh, I'm not going to go through this uh, in detail. You'll be uh, happy to know. <clears throat> um, but does the study protocol state the results will be used for clinical decision making? Uh, up here at the top, if uh, you go to yes, then uh, FLIS certified lab is the appropriate uh, way to go. Uh, if it's no, then we want to provide some opportunities, uh, again, for the laboratory result to be generated in a CLIA certified lab. And again, this gets out of the handcuffs I'd mentioned a little bit earlier with CLIA, where they want to say, even telling somebody that we found something that we need to confirm in a, a CLIA certified lab environment, we need to get a new blood sample um, and uh, uh, test it in a more rigorous environment. Um, again, the CLIA folks say that's not permissible because that in and of itself right now is considered the return of a result of sorts. So this breaks down that um, problem and allows uh, results to be obtained uh, uh, in a CLIA certified laboratory environment or perhaps in the uh, uh, environment that will be generated with this new uh, externally accountable quality management uh, system. On the far side here where you see the red box, um, Will the results be generated in a laboratory using alternative quality management system processes? If the answer is no, then no return of results. So that we're still trying to maintain quality laboratory analysis as a crucial criterion for uh, communication. So investigators uh, uh, should uh, seek uh, information on um, the attitudes of the participant group being engaged for this research protocol. Now, that doesn't mean always you have to have a focus group orientation and go out and talk to people directly, although in many circumstances that will be appropriate. You got a big study like all of us that's going to be returning results. That's a, that would be entirely appropriate enterprise. Um, in other circumstances, folks may well have adequately dealt with this community. They know the community attitudes. They have uh, people who have, uh, uh, can speak in a knowledgeable way about the uh, community attitudes. Um, you know, then you review the literature, you have an advisory board, uh, et cetera. And we think research institutions uh, should facilitate that. You know, if you're left as an individual investigator saying, okay, how, what do I do to engage this community about this issue? You know, I'm a uh, molecular geneticist. I don't know about such things. You ought to have institutional support. You know, the CTSA organization would be one uh, example of institutions that are supposed to be, I mean, they're developing these sorts of community engagement resources so that you turn to the institutional resource to help you uh, manage that communication. Uh, sponsors also should engage community and participant representatives uh, in the development of uh, policy uh, and guidance. <clears throat> so communication uh, um, in the consent process, uh, uh, clarity is essential. Investigators should communicate in clear language to research participants which individual research results they can access uh, uh, under HIPAA, and which, if any, results will be uh, offered. So this is new, too. I'm pretty sure a lot of uh, institutions are not routinely telling participants that they have a HIPAA access right to uh, certain data sets, right? Because very few people access their information. Is that because they don't want it? Maybe, but maybe because they don't know they can get it if they ask for it. So routinely telling people, actually, then, is we think is going to actually increase the number of folks who are interested in uh, this information. Uh, if results are going to be offered, then the consent should state uh, in brief, concise terms, clear terms, risks and benefits, um, when people might get urgent results, and the time and process by which results will be communicated, whether the results be uh, placed in the medical record or communicated to the clinician, and when relevant, the participant's option to have results shared with family members if the participant becomes incapacitated or deceased. And this last one would be most relevant to certain types of research where you're dealing with participants who may well have a shorter lifespan and might die during the conduct of the research. So the time and process, uh, I don't think I make this point otherwise, critical that we emphasize, nobody's thinking that this return of results should ever threaten the integrity of the research itself. So you're not going to be returning results that might reveal, you know, which group they've been uh, randomized to, that sort of thing. So uh, may well be many of these results are going to be communicated towards the tail end of the project when uh, um, those sorts of issues then become don't, uh, aren't problematic. So uh, effective communication strategies. Uh, investigators and institutions should communicate results in ways that explicitly convey clear takeaway messages, uh, 
statements of actionability, uh, should pair results uh, communications with reference information uh, so that people can understand it. How do I, what does this number mean for me? What, where, where do other people sit with this number? Uh, how do I interpret it uh, is the notion here. Should include caveat statements about uncertainties and limitations of the results and, and aligned communication approaches to the different needs, uh, resources, backgrounds of the participants. Let me just say, I think the environmental research folks have really done, uh, have been at the forefront of this over a number of years. For whatever reason, they've had more of a um, tradition of uh, proactively returning results from environmental research studies. And some folks have developed some very clever, uh, uh, innovative strategies to help communicate uh, uh, results to um, across uh, communities. Sponsors and funding agencies support additional research to better understand the benefits and harms uh, and enable the development of best practices. So kind of boilerplate. We need more research in this domain to uh, find out how best to do this and to avoid the pitfalls. Uh, harmonize regulations to revise and harmonize relevant regulations in a way that respects the interests of participants, balances competing considerations of safety, quality, and the burdens to the research enterprise. Um, this became a big topic of discussion and we think uh, uh, important. Um, HHS should ensure that all regulations refer to research participants rather than research subjects in accordance with the ethical principles of autonomy and respect for persons. So this is kind of a, seems like a small thing, but in fact, it's, it, it's imp very important to people. So specifically with regulations, um, we think the Office of Civil Rights, uh, which is the governor of uh, HIPAA, should define the designated record set to include only individual research results generated in a CLIA certified lab or under this uh, new externally accountable quality management uh, uh, system. So the notion of the DRS is that this is information that might be used for decision making about people. And that's a big universe of uh, uh, data and information. Uh, but if we're specifically saying uh, experimental results that have not been generated in a quality lab should never be used for any sort of decision making, then let's define that as being outside the DRS, meaning folks don't, won't have access to it under their HIPAA access rights. Um, require HIPAA-covered entities to conduct research on human biospecimen to develop a plan for the release of individual in the DRS to participants. I think a lot of institutions at this point just don't have a lot of experience with this because nobody uh, commonly asks, but uh, institutions ought to think through how they're going to do this in an efficient way. CMS, now the governors of CLIA, should revise CLIA such that when there's a legal obligation under the HIPAA access right to return research results, a laboratory will not be considered in violation of CLIA and need not obtain CLIA certification. Um, also, should allow research results to be returned from non-CLIA certified laboratory when they're not intended for clinical decision making, uh, et cetera. And this is just reinforcing the flow diagram that I'd showed previously. Here's a HIPAA diagram. Uh, and again, I won't uh, take the time to go into any detail uh, here, but basically uh, reiterates the um, recommendations just made about how uh, HIPAA ought to be uh, revised and access rights there. So a couple final thoughts. What we're looking for here is really a process-oriented approach. Again, we're not categorizing results, uh, uh, types of research uh, as uh, returnable, not returnable. We want folks to think this through from early in the research protocol development process, working with sponsors to fund it if it needs to be uh, a funded part of the uh, activity, work with the IRB so that they're familiar uh, and uh, can review the uh, protocol uh, appropriately uh, and make uh, uh, decisions in a careful manner. We think over time this is going to increase uh, the return of individual research uh, results as people develop the necessary expertise, infrastructure, policies, and resources to do this. So important to emphasize, weren't, you know, the, our committee wasn't suggesting that there be a revolution out there, uh, but there'd be an evolution. This is going to take a little bit of time. We want enough pressure that there's some movement in that direction, um, but not to suggest that, uh, uh, you know, tomorrow folks need to be uh, uh, jumping uh, into this activity without having uh, uh, fully considered. So I think the initial investments will be significant, but there's going to be a return on those investments in terms of, we hope, enhancing participant trust and engagement uh, and higher quality standards for research laboratories. Uh, 
And of course, the emphasis with this presentation is talking about quality, allowing the return of results in certain circumstances. But probably a much bigger point is enhanced laboratory quality is going to be a huge boon to the research enterprise more generally, as folks are concerned about the whole challenge of re reproducibility. And so this will have uh, um, quality management systems will have many uh, advantages uh, well beyond this issue of return of results. So there is a PDF available, and I checked uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, we had, had at that point 4,673 downloads. So uh, I think there's pretty uh, significant interest in this topic, um, and uh, this has been uh, pretty briskly downloaded to this point. So I'm going to stop uh, here a little long. Do we, uh, do we still have questions? <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff, for for that um, report. And one of the things I'm I'm interested in is if there are specific recommendations for return of results over time. So our understanding of the significance of specific genetic variants is going to change. And so a variant that we may have unknown may have an unknown function now, may have a direct relevance to a patient care down the road. And was this specific topic addressed in these, these recommendations for how best to do that? Well, probably only somewhat tangentially. We recognize that problem. And it's, of course, a problem in genetics, but it's a problem in almost any experimental field where you're going to have uh, moving uh, understandings of what uh, previous research had shown. Uh, we felt that the obligation of uh, investigators uh, and uh, institutions specifically around the return result probably ends with the end of the research project itself, uh, at least from sort of a more formal structural sense of obligation. Now, it, it depends on the circumstance, obviously, and if you're an investigator and a clinician for a small number of folks who you've been working with uh, around a particular health condition, then you probably have an ethical obligation to follow up with them and reinterpret. But that's not going to be the most common uh, uh, circumstance. And so I think that does uh, uh, raise some real challenges for folks who uh, may have an understanding based on five year ago, five year ago interpretation and a whole new uh, domain uh, now. Okay, I've got Steve and then I'll... So as, as one of the 4673 downloaders, I have to say it's, it's an important step forward and the 30-plus page executive summary was also important. Um, I would like to go back to what Jonathan had brought up earlier with the polygenic risk score being so now incredibly used in not only in myocardial infarction, diabetes, and so forth. It's going to be used probably as a screening tool to say that you're at high genetic risk, you should be screened more often, and so forth. Uh, the, the technology is such that probably the variants used in this are not clinically actionable. So how do you consider this process, or should the academy start considering this over again? Now, with respect to the polygenic risk score, where you say, what is it that we return? How do we return if requested? And, and the entire aspect of trying to communicate this aspect of complex human disease, where high genetic risk doesn't mean you're destined to get the disease, but you may want to check on your levels of biomarkers more often. Yeah. <clears throat> you do a polygenic risk score in, in a CLIA approved lab? Is that something CLIA labs can do? A thousand SNP polygenic risk score. Six million SNP. Yeah. I think our guys always want the positive and negative. Right. Yeah. 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 Thanks very much for, uh, for leading this very important uh, topic. My question, though, as to, is to whether or not there was discussion in your group regarding some unintended liability issues. For example, most large institutions are self-insured, and they uh, uh, secure their self-insurance, their reinsurance, through the assumption that the, they're performing clinical studies. And when there's clinical misadventure, the liability would not naturally accrue to that institution. Now, if in fact these are research um, results, that were not secured during a clinical in interaction and the research results are returned and there is a, uh, a decision that was inappropriate based on that particular research results, 
was there a discussion uh, in your group regarding how these these decisions should be communicated with risk management so that when they secure insurance, they secure insurance knowing that there not only may be clinical misadventures, but there pot potentially could be research misadventures, which are usually not covered under your clinical uh, self-insurance trusts. Mm. Uh, no, and I would say we did not uh, develop that uh, uh, or um, analyze that set of concerns, which certainly sounds uh, um, uh, important. The, uh, I think the process that we're looking for, though, is one in which at least an investigator would have substantial backup through a peer review process to say, you know, the peer reviewers thought this was acceptable. Um, the uh, IRB gave you approval to do this. You engage the appropriate folks to communicate the information, et cetera. So at least it wouldn't look uh, negligent in terms of how it would be approached. And as we see the evolution of this practice evolve, then you might well say that's more consistent with the standard of care now to return these kinds of results than it would be uh, perhaps uh, at that point than it would be uh, right now. So um, if you have an individual investigator that makes a, their personal decision to go ahead and do this and somebody's harmed in a current environment, it seems to me that's where liability could be substantial. I mean, I think the, I think the approach is very reasonable. I mean, I, I, I am supportive. It makes sense. I, I'm glad it, the, this is done. I just think that it's important that whomever um, takes the lead, takes this on, certainly should make certain that uh, it is a, a, an added component of the self-insurance component because there could be research misadventures, which typically is not a part of your clinical trusts. Good, thank you. Chair, sure. and then when? Well, I had a separate question, but relevant to that, most of our IRB protocols actually do, do, do have language about harm. So, and that you won't be compensated for harm from participating in the protocol. So the institutions must have thought about it because there are all kinds of potential harms that come from research projects, not just this potential harm. Uh, but I, I mean, I think it's a great question, but I think there has been some look at the insurance around research harms for human subjects research. My question is, is I'm one of those researchers in the middle, um, and I think, the, I think the report is excellent, but what's the plan for the interim? You know, there are thousands of patients who have, or sub participants, who have given samples for often very serious illnesses where the lab won't have fallen under this new structure. And I haven't read the report yet, but is there some discussion of, of the interim? Uh, because there are definitely people in my own genetic studies who have HIPAA rights and had language about returns of results that won't have met this new standard, which I think is a great idea. Yeah. Uh, and I would say, no, we have not dealt with the uh, complexities of the interim in which, you know, as mentioned, the, the old consent form says one thing, the new science uh, is posing new dilemmas. I will say, though, that uh, Barbara Beer's group has come out with a nice uh, uh, statement, and I can uh, email uh, reference uh, to you. I can't remember the name of the group that she worked with to do that. But basically, to some extent, it was also a process-based uh, uh, organization by setting up um, what they called uh, something institutional informed consent support groups or something. But basically, it was a notion of uh, experts who can help advise institutions and IRBs on how to deal with incidental circumstances or unanticipated findings as they come up now, specifically yeah, I, I with this conflict. I would argue that it's not always incidental. In fact, the results I've returned over the, over the last 15 years have more been actually finding the cause of a disorder where the child has now died and there's no possibility of having a clear sample, but for which it's highly relevant for the rest of the family. Yeah. So I don't think these are all, I think incidental yeah. findings are important. But I don't think we should ignore that most people enter research studies because they have an interest in a particular disease Good. in their family. Yeah. Well, I'd refer you to that uh, Barbara Beer's work on that that might uh, give some additional guidance on the awkward period we're in. Wendy? And then Nancy? Uh, 
It seems to me to be able to scale this, um, especially for folks that are non-geneticists, there are three components that could centrally be built to enable this. Part of it is data generation, another segment is data interpretation, and then the third is actually a mechanism to return the information in a responsible way. Did the committee think about that or foresee that that's the way the community would go, or is this going to be each study sort of out for themselves in all three components? No, I think we thought quite a bit about the, the kinds of um, expertise that were going to be necessary here, and particularly those elements that were somewhat new to the landscape. And I would say the laboratorians and understanding laboratory science and laboratory standards is not something IRBs, uh, for the most part, have familiarity with. So they're going to they either bring in experts or seat somebody on the panels with that level of expertise. Uh, in addition, uh, very impressed with our communication scholars who could help us understand better ways, standard ways to communicate stuff. And I think uh, a lot of us in medicine and sciences uh, um, think we're communicating effectively, uh, but there's lots of research and principles out there that uh, we very much benefit from. And a lot of times those folks are uh, at our very same universities, but we've never talked to them, right? So that's sort of this notion of bringing other folks in uh, and potentially doing that uh, very much on a research basis as we get uh, into this. So instead of just returning results, why not return results under an experimental uh, protocol so that you're actually collecting data on that piece too uh, while you uh, uh, proceed forward. So um, so I think we did uh, recognize that there's new new faces at the table with us. We'll see. So just a, a final comment on the polygenic risk scores. They've really flown under the radar and all of this stuff. And it's, it's a little bit crazy that it's not being addressed at all in, in any context in terms of, do you, you know, CLIA. And it's not even, I mean, people have to be aware it's not just in return of results. It's actually in the use of the information in this so whole under the radar space of, you know, all the modeling that um, learning health systems already do, the prospect of just adding genetics to that, is there going to be any, I mean, is, is there regulation needed or not? And, you know, are people just going to start doing it in the absence of any further discussion? It, it's, it's a little bit of the Wild West out there um, with respect to this. And I, I think because so much of the LC space has been in large effect variants, and the, the people who've been working on this, it, it really has flown under the radar very quickly. And I, it seems like somebody needs to draw attention to this space sooner rather than later. Well, and I've been very impressed just with the discussion over the last hour about this particular uh, uh, issue. And I guess I would make just a couple comments in this context. It seems to me that uh, I don't know what, what the, the various findings that are being published now, what would one consider to be the clinical validity of those findings at this point? What are the, what's the analytic validity to begin with? I don't know. What's the clinical validity and when is it ripe for um, return? It seems to me I would uh, be reluctant to have individual IRBs and investigators try to make calls on some of those things at this point. And this seems to me pretty ripe for professional societies to sort of pick this up and say, here's the state of the art here. We, we think this is the best thing since uh, uh, sequencing and uh, everybody ought to be doing it or, you know, whatever the professional opinion is to give guidance to the whole community about uh, this emerging phenomenon. Still want to turn this thing on. Um, one is the, the polygenic <coughs> score. So enough has been said about that to highlight the idea that it's there, it's coming, uh, and and whether whether it's you know its validity and its clinical applicability is still being worked out. But but there it is. The other um, the other thought that I had as I was listening to you and and that uh, echoes a little bit what Wendy said is that. Uh, we're returning results now in, in part of a large eMERGE project uh, to, to participants, I'm looking at the right word, and um, 
<laughs> One of the things they do in, as part of that protocol uh, is go off and discuss the results with their primary care physicians. And the, uh -huh. the group that is giving us the biggest pushback right now is the primary care physicians. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want it. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And yet they are a critical part of how people will handle that information and their health care going forward. So some mechanism to engage, and we've said this at, at this meeting and many other places over and over again, but some, it, it becomes more and more urgent as you start to return results to patients and they have this expectation that somebody is going to help them, uh, somebody beyond a website is going to help them understand what to do uh, for themselves and their families. It can't all be uh, genetic specialists because there just aren't enough in the world. Jay. So, so I mean, it just occur, you know, if you look at that graph of the number of people who've had genotyping done, you know, primarily for ancestry reasons, it's it's like it's somewhere between ten and twenty million, and going up at a very fast rate, right? And so, you know, at some point in the next year or so, someone is going to put up a website where anyone can go and plug in their results, which will primarily not be obtained through the medical system, but rather through these ancestry or whatever it is, and and get some prediction, right? And, and there's a little bit out of scope of return of results, but it's, it's, it's going to happen and inevitably create headaches. Um, and I'm just curious, I mean, I don't, I don't know if anyone's really thinking about this yet. I'm sure people are thinking about it, but uh, it does seem like the, an area which merits some regulation or at least some close attention, but. Rudy, so interviewed in the New York Times after his article came out, Sake said he's putting up that website. There you go. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> and I, I trust him to do a good job of it, but I'm sure other people will, will put similar websites up and yeah, and yeah. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Okay, thank you. anticipated, it was of interest to this group. So uh, let's uh, adjourn for lunch. Can we be back at 1.15 in this room? And again, for the council members, we're bringing food in to you. Okay, see you at 1.15. So you guys are on lunch right now?